Okay, um, let's call to order the Board of Selectmen meeting for January 24th. It's 6.01 p.m. And we always start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so, so tonight we are starting off um, the meeting with a public hearing on the American Rescue Plan Act. We've gotten a lot of response from residents. We have a lot of written responses and we have about 20 people that are here to speak. And so I'd like to, like to, to call, to, call to, pardon me? Is there a question from? Yeah, everybody okay. that's not speaking needs to put their phone on. Yeah, mute. please. Please mute. Thanks, Sean. So I, I'm going to I'm going to go through the list first. We're going to start with people that are on the call, so that if they want to leave, they can leave, and then we'll get to reading the letters and emails that have come in. Um, so I'm going to start with my list, and the first one on my list is Susan Messino. And if you could state your name and your um, address, thanks. And Susan, you're muted. Um. Hi, good evening. Um, I hope my audio is okay. I've been having some problems. Um, I, I missed the very beginning and I think this purpose of this is just to say a few words about the ARPA funding. Um, is this is, that's correct, right? Yes, okay, yes. sorry. Um, so I just wanted to make a plea to um, really think about things that we, um, haven't been able to do that are not going to be ongoing costs and also things that we could do that are going to be proactive at preventing future costs. Um, and I can send in some other written ideas that I have and I've shared with some people about, you know, housing and transportation issues. But I really wanted to just talk tonight about some open space issues that have been open and un kind of addressed for a long time. And one of those is getting a better understanding of the ecology in town. Um, we That was one of the goals for the open space master plan, which didn't exactly um, happen. It takes a little bit of time because you need to go at multiple seasons. Um, we really need to do an update on what we have. We have no handle on insects, very few towns do. And this would be a real opportunity. It's not costly at all just to do a complete survey of the plants in Onion Mountain, I had gotten an estimate, it was about $4,000. So we're not talking about you know, a huge amount of money, but something that's really valuable in terms of understanding our ecology and how it's connected. There's also a couple of open space issues related to invasives that can progressively degrade the ecology of our environment. Um, and all of our you know, valid data surveys that we have um, issues about nature and biodiversity and hiking and things like that are always a top priority of people in town. And if we don't deal with issues with this encroachment of invasives and erosion of our trails that have gotten very, very heavy use during the pandemic, um, we have some kind of pond areas that were um, dredged a while ago and they need um, additional work. Um, these are all things that will serve our health and being for long into the future and don't incur ongoing annual costs to our budget. So I'm planning to work with the Open Space Commission to get some more um, specifics on this, but these are all topics that have been around for a long time, um, and I appreciate your attention. Thanks, Susan. Um, one thing I want to add is we're, we're going to try to keep people to three minutes. Um, we're going to do it on the honor system so I don't have to use a stopwatch. So just please kind of pay attention to the time that you, you have. Um, I have Elizabeth Burt, who is next up. So Elizabeth on the call. Okay. I'm going to move forward to Jacqueline Haves. I see Elizabeth's name, oh, but I think okay. she might be muted. Yeah, so okay. I'm not sure. Oh, here I am. Um, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Do you have me now? Elizabeth yep. Burt. Okay. Um, I'm a resident at 12 Woods Lane in Simsbury. I'm a member of the Pine Hill 
Homeowners Association, and I am also a member of the board. And we are requesting some sort of funding to assist us with the replacement of our 50-year-old, at least 50-year-old sewers. At this time, we all pay property taxes, but we got, get no direct assistance from the town in road repairs, sewer maintenance, water maintenance, electricity, all of that we pay out of our homeowner fees. At this point, we need to replace the sewers, which are backing up flooding basements. And we've had an estimate from Tom Roy of approximately $650,000, which would be funded by a 10-year loan. And that would work out to approximately $1,700 to $2,000 per year per homeowner. These are small homes. We are not wealthy people. Many of us are retired. And anything the town can do to assist us with this funding for replacing our sewers would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Elizabeth. Um, Jacqueline? Yeah, I'm here. So I'm also going to speak on behalf of that same issue. So my name is Jackie Crockett. Actually, I was married last year. Um, my husband and I live on Stebbinsbrook Lane in Pine Hill, and I'm also on the board of the Pine Hill Homeowners Association. Um, and so I'm here to appeal to the board and fellow residents to support our request that a portion of the ARPA funds are used to replace the sewers in Pine Hill. Um, I think it's important to note that this is not the first time we've approached the selectmen about the sewer issues. Uh, during Wendy's campaign for first selectmen, she visited Pine Hill and spoke to a few of the residents. Paul and Don Peterson, who are also on the call, made her aware of our sewer issues and she conveyed to them that the town may be getting these federal funds that would be available for a project like ours. Um, so months later in December, Dan Diodato, also on this call, and I met with Wendy and Eric via Zoom and we talked at length about the sewer issues. Um, but at that time, they weren't sure if our project was even eligible since the sewers are privately owned by the HOA. But we then have learned um, that the town's finance director has been able to confirm that our project is an eligible expense. So as many people in town are aware, uh, Pine Hill is of historical importance to the town and our 39 homes account for over $250,000 in the annual tax revenue for the town. Uh, the Pine Hill home values are modest, well below the average in Simsbury and residents here don't have the same economic power to solve an expense. Uh, expensive problem like our sewers. Our sewer system's over 100 years old, actually, and desperately needs to be updated. Uh, the board has done what is in our power, meaning the HOA board, uh, to raise funds for repairs through special assessments, but the need for repairs is becoming more frequent, more urgent, and unaffordable due to the state of the sewers. And even with these special assessments, we can't come close to covering the estimated costs we've been given by Tom Roy. So there's been already an extensive review of the state of the sewers by the town at our expense, and there's a laundry list of concerns, most notably a large area of the sewer line that is a quarter of the way full of sewage, and the environmental ramifications for not completing this project could have dire consequences for our residents and for the town. So my understanding is that our project is not only eligible for the funds, but should be on the high priority list. The fund is made available specifically for the use of water and sewer infrastructure projects and is also specifically made available to fund projects that would otherwise be financed by loans with interest. So the total cost for our project would equate to per household about $18,000 plus interest. And many of the residents in Pine Hill are elderly and on fixed incomes or are young families on modest incomes. And the dis this additional cost is going to create hardships. So I'm just here to request that the town make available to us a portion of these federal funds and make this very necessary investment in our sewers. Thank you, Jackie. Um, Barbara Conroy. Is Barbara Conroy on the call? I, I, I am here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> hi. <laughs> uh, I'm Barbara Conroy uh, from 8 Middle Lane. I'm also a member of Pine Hill Homeowners. Uh, and actually, and I'm on the board of uh, directors for that as well. And I, um, now that I followed Jackie, I don't have much more to add, except that I am, um, what code? Uh, w some of us are concerned uh, about our sewers because our, we're totally, our 
Our sewer pipes are totally not in code. We have six inch pipes. Uh, the code I believe says they need to be eight, eight inches and they're clay pipes with roots growing through many of them. So we're in kind of desperate need for that. And I just would wanted to say that I've been a resident in this home in Simsbury since 1978 and paid taxes and participated in many volunteer positions here in town and am looking forward to hearing a good response from our request. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. And Jerry Littner. Jerry there. Oh, hi, Jerry. You are on. There we go. <laughs> okay, now I get windy, so um, wave if I get near three minutes. My name <laughs> is Jerry Lintner. I'm at 22 Masako Street. And I, I, I'm calling, it's a little confusing with the two sources of money coming in. One of this meeting, I understand, is on the ARPA, but then also there's infrastructure that's coming also. So what I want to talk about is the bridge, the flower bridge, and what it means to the community. And all of you will be getting, well, not some of the guests, I guess, but all of the selectmen, uh, the town manager, some of the town staff, um, some of the commissions will be getting a 21-page report, the majority of which is pictures from 2015, when this was first submitted, documenting the corrosion that was then uh, severely affecting the bridge. Well, in six years, that obviously has progressed even more. So while the bridge may not qualify for the ARPA funds, it was in my thought that perhaps some of the things scheduled for the infrastructure, that if they now qualified for the ARPA, that that might free up some money. Uh, the bridge project has kept getting pushed back and pushed back. And after a while, <laughs> the bridge is not going to be redeemable. So something needs to be done. Just as a quick thing, what the bridge has meant to the community. Uh, certainly the ethics, certainly a place of, of gathering, a place to um, take pause. And a lot of people do that. And usually if it's not snow, you'll see that all the parking places are taken. Uh, those of us who volunteer, we started out, what, 26 years ago, there were 12 of us, four boxes. There are now 70 of us, and there are 118 boxes, baskets, whatever. And we've been pleased to take on the challenge of creating a pollinating pathway around the areas of the meadow and on the west side of the bridge. So when working there and deadheading, Part of what gets in your way is there are so many visitors who stop to thank you and then have questions about it. One of the things we were doing and didn't do, do during um, COVID was to put a brochure, this is not going to show well, of the eating places in town, uh, restaurants, takeout, whatever, of which there are 42. So we feel that, well, we've run into people after we've done our duty and have lunch who found their way there using the map. We feel that the bridge offers a lot to the community, has become iconic. People come from all over <laughs> that have heard about the bridge. So that is my request. I know you guys feel good about it. I know the problem is money is tight and there are many things there that are competitive. But between these two things, it would be a great possibility if we could get that back on schedule. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jerry. Um, and next up, I have Joan Coe. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Joan Coe, 26 Whitcomb Drive. The town has an opportunity to use the $7.5 million on building infrastructure and large capital projects. The HVAC ventilation system in Town Hall has had a compromised system for decades. 
Decades ago, the certificate of occupancy of town hall was in question due to the air quality in the HVAC ventilation system. Over the years, nothing has been done. Town Hall is a heating and, and cooling system that needs a delivery system of heat and cooling that are consistent throughout the building. During the summer, some of the offices are dangerously hot, while others are too cool. During the winter, some offices, uh, so, uh, during the winter, employees need heaters to warm the room or wear heavy shawls to, uh, or coats to keep warm. Many of the OSHA guidelines are violated. The HVAC ventilation system in town hall should be upgraded. All the schools should have air conditioning throughout the buildings to increase the use of building all, all year for the public. During the storms, the police department rooms are flooded. They now use sandbags to slow the water from entering the building. Water should be diverted with a drainage swale Mold grows in damp areas, causing a health risk. The police department should not be located in the basement of town hall where there is mold due to flooding in the offices. There is a vacant lot that is situated at 1285 Hop Meadow Street, the Wagner Auto property that has been vacant for years that, should, that could accommodate the needs of the police department. The APRA money could be used to acquire the property. Water coming from the golf course at Simsbury Farms and running into the parking lot at the tennis and paddle parking area are causing ice buildups that is dangerous. People have been hurt entering and exiting their cars. A drainage swale should be engineered to divert the water flow. There should be pickleball courts on, the, uh, on all tennis courts lined at Simsbury Farms with lights that could be used 24-7, and this would reduce vandalism. There could be pickleball courts constructed with lights at Caraville Park. Access points throughout the town for internet and Wi-Fi should be constructed to eliminate dead spots for public safety and economic development. Libraries have evolved into media centers. A perfect fit for the library is SCTV as an additional resource for the community. A collaborative effort between SCTV and the library would increase the media accessibility to the public and the businesses. The library should repurpose areas for SCTV to move into the library for increased media use, leaving more room for senior activities at Eno Hall. The infrastructure is already in the area for SCTV. Using the 7.5 million pound investment for the American Rescue Plan Act that I have noted will serve the public long term and add to the quality of life for everyone. All of my comments will be posted on Simsbury Patch, Twitter at Joan Co., and Facebook. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Joan, for that very comprehensive list. Um, next up, we have Michael Gannis. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, I appreciate your uh, making uh, time for us to speak this evening. Uh, my name is Michael Gannis. I live at Nine Middle Lane. I'm a member of the Pine Hill homeowners association and also serve on the board of directors for that organization. I've also lived here for 20 years. So I'm one of the uh, newcomers. Um, on November 3rd, we met our uh, residents of our community met with uh, Tony Guzzo of the WPCA after it became um, evident that there was a possibility we could count on the town for some assistance with a long-term problem that we've been dealing with, namely our sewers. We learned after an evaluation of our sewer system, uh, some by camera and some by personal knowledge of the people at WPCA, that one of your long-term partners, an important financial anchor in the town, Ensign Bickford, uh, when they decided to divest themselves of the um, community, they put in the sewer system. And when they put in the sewer system, it not only didn't meet code because of the size of the pipes, but it violated what was considered to be basic industry standards of installation vis-a-vis 45-degree -vis angles and no slope on sewage pipes. So the problem with our sewage pipes started at their inception, and it isn't just the age. Um, I am not an engineer, and I could be completely wrong, but I believe that we are an ecological disaster waiting to happen. It will not only impact our community, will also impact the town through our uh, 
contiguous border with Hop Meadow Street. I'll close by saying that I have paid taxes here for 20 years. That's probably something that you hate hearing. I don't say it uh, to be rude, but I've often resented the fact that having to pay taxes here at the same time, not getting certain town services, we certainly get the life-saving services, um, has always bothered me. Now ARPA funds are available, and so I'm going to respectfully request that although I'm hearing many very worthy requests for money this evening, I respectfully request that the town of Simsbury release my tax dollars. Those are dollars I contributed to that went to the federal government. They have come back to the town of Simsbury to help people with the quality of their life. People in my community are being forced out of their homes. They're being forced to live with their children in hotels because their basements are filling up with sewage. This will become a worse problem as time goes on. Please consider helping our community. It would make a huge difference in our quality of life down the road. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, Michael. And next up, we have Carolyn Boucher. Does anyone see Carolyn in here? Okay. I'm going to move down to Dan Diodato. Is Dan here? Y yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm, I'm Dan Diodato, and house. and uh, tell me you're at Barbara's house. Yeah, I I am at Barbara Conroy's house because I'm having a technological problem, and uh, she graciously uh, invited me over. Um, I, I would just like to uh, uh, say, where you're say a few things that um, Jackie did not say, uh, in which uh, she uh, you did a great job, Jackie. Um, anyway. Um, today, uh, we received a final ruling. We've been doing some research from the United States Department of Treasury. And, and according to this document, by April of 2022, um, there will be uh, increased flexibility to provide a wider range of uses for funding. And uh, so, uh, so there, there's an array of things, uh, but um, such as uh, broad, broadening eligibility uh, for water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure projects. Uh, so those are some of the projects that will be included. Um, I'd, I'd like to just um, tell you a little bit about, so there, there, there's been a, a plethora of of information that has come down from the government, uh, which has been extremely helpful in, um, in coming up with our uh, uh, presentations. Um, and one thing that I'd like to point out is that um, eight, approximately eight years ago, um, some of us from the community met with um, the town officials. Uh, Lisa Hebner was, uh, the uh, chair was the uh, first select woman, and um, and uh, we met with, with with Lisa and with others on a number of occasions. And it was determined because we are a PUD. Uh, we own our property. We own our land. Our, our houses are small, and um, we uh, and we are a an association, which. Uh, does not enable us to receive any help from the town uh, other than uh, we pay our tax dollars, our schools, our fire, our police, library, et cetera, uh, nothing else. And um, so we've, we've been very handicapped in that respect because many times we try to change our archaic bylaws and have been extremely unsuccessful because one third of our population of um, here at Pine Hill are um, investors. And um, some, some of whom are not interested in the, um, how should I say, in our community. They're not fully invested. 
They're, they're, okay. they're interested in the rents and that's it. That's a real problem that we have. And so that's a strike against us. And um, so I, I just wanted to make that point uh, that we have tried everything. We, after the, um, eight years ago, after we met, there was no way we could get grants. Um, and we had to say, okay, then we're going to do the Band-Aid approach. The Band-Aids no longer work. Calm down. They no, they no longer work. And um, so I'm asking you to really consider the importance because of the environmental issues involved, the displacement of potential displacement of peoples, and for the overall benefit of the homeowners who truly enjoy living here in this community. I really ask you once again, please consider. Thank you, Dan. You're Thanks. welcome, and thank you. Sure. Okay, um, now we're moving on to TJ Ocure. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, so sorry, TJ. And I don't know if TJ's here either. Any TJ here? Okay, I'm going to skip TJ. I'm going to go to Kathy Creedon. Kathy. Okay. Um, Sarah, Amara. Is Sarah here? Okay. Just all these people did sign up to speak tonight. So I'm just making sure I cover everyone. I have Joyce Martins. Yes, this is Joyce Martins from Eight Woods Lane. I just wanted to dial in to, to kind of put in my two cents of support for the request for funds for the sewers in our, in our community. I have a sump pump in my basement for this exact reason. Um, we've had a lot of issues. Our neighbors have really been hit even harder with um, some of the, the issues <clears throat> that have resulted from the age and condition of the sewers. Um, so I just wanted to kind of buy for support of um, the Pine Hill Homeowners Association request for funds. Thank you, Joyce. And, and so does my three-year-old. <laughs> your three-year-old. Um, okay. And I have Kevin Frazier, Frazier up next. Is Kevin there? No. Matthew Clark. Mm -mm. Okay. Matthew Clark going once, twice. I see Gary. So I know he's on. Gary Wilcox. I am. Good evening, Wendy. Hey, Gary. I'm Gary Wilcox, president of the Simsbury Fire District. To the best of my knowledge, there has been no consideration to include fire districts in the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Most towns in Connecticut have their fire departments in their own budgets and their tax base. A handful of towns like Simsbury were set up differently establishing a separate municipal organization with separate taxing authorities. Regardless of the organizational differences, the Simsbury Fire District and the Simsbury Volunteer Fire Company are very much a part of Simsbury. We strive to work seamlessly with the town, and I can't thank you all enough for being our partner. And we together, we make it work very well. We really do. While this pandemic has brought many challenges, the cooperation we share does make it seamless to our citizens. Our volunteer force of 100 strong has answered every call and being volunteer saves the taxpayers an incredible amount of money each year. There are many ways we interact with the town. The Simsbury Fire District provides the emergency management director and deputy director who have put in countless hours of prep in all aspects of this pandemic. The Simsbury Fire District has worked closely with the Simsbury Police in their new radio upgrade, this partnership has saved the town hundreds of thousands of dollars through mutual use of our district radio towers. Although we have, in, we have invested tens of thousands of dollars in our own radio upgrades so we can keep our interoperability of communication between our emergency services. 
Clearly, this is not a complaint in any way whatsoever. It's simply the cost of doing business and ensuring that we are always prepared to continue the to ensure the safety of our firefighters. We have done things like over the last few years, we've outfitted them with second set of gear for their own safety. We've enhanced our cleaning protocols, including fogging of the interiors of our equipment as needed. And what I would like to ask for would be a proportional sharing of these funds. Is it fair to look at budget amounts or mill rates amounts for an equitable formula? The fire district budget or mill rate is slightly more than 3% of the town's budget and mill rate. I'd be happy to provide hard numbers of costs and capital projects should you need any of that to substantiate that 3% request. Thank you. Thanks, Gary, for presenting that. Um, next up is Allison Edwards. Hmm. I don't see Allison Edwards. And last, I have Emily Vincent. Anyone see Emily Vincent on the call? No. Okay. So. Just muted yourself. Thank you. I don't know how I did that. Okay. So. I don't know where you stopped hearing me, but we're going to move on to the written portion of tonight. Um, we did get a couple letters included in the packet that I'm not going to read through in full because everyone can read them as they're attached, but I just wanted to highlight who they were from and what they were about. The first one is from Brandon Robertson as it pertains to the Farmington Valley Health District. And they're, they're saying that the Farmington Valley Health District is a regional organization that does not receive ARPA funds and that um, as a regional partner, we should consider providing some funding to them. That's the first thing. The other thing is a letter from the, the um, Simsbury Farms, friends of the Simsbury Farms, to look at um, allocating some of the money, given that it's their 50th year anniversary. And they're looking for some um, assistance on a number of projects that are currently included in the town's capital plan, um, including the fitness trail. And that was from, I thought it was from Mark Deming, but I don't see the name on my letter. So those two are in everyone's um, packet out on our, on our link and you can read those. So now we have a bunch of letters and I'm gonna start out and then I'm gonna ask Amber Abiel, the deputy first selectman to read. We're gonna go through them in that order. So just bear with us um, for this. And thanks for speaking for everybody. So the first letter that I have is from Michael Smith. And his letter is, you could send the money back to the government. It would help the country since we have to pay it back one way or the other. The next letter is from April Smith. Divide the money evenly amongst homeowners, not apartment dwellers. Taxpayers in Simsbury never get tax relief of any kind. No one gets more or less evenly divided. Sandra Fleet. Um, dear Mrs. Capriola, Ms. Capriola, we are writing to you regarding so don't expand this regarding the public hearing on January 24th, 2022, addressing the ARPA funding and ask the town to consider the housing authority when allocating these funds. The housing authority provides affordable housing for the elderly and disabled population. The Virginia Con Connolly residence is a congregate facility where frail elderly are provided many services, which include 24 hour security, one noontime meal, 365 days a year and weekly housekeeping. This facility allows the residents to receive services, but to still live independently without being in a nursing care center setting. We previously submitted a letter to your office, which outlined the housing authorities unforeseen expenses during the pandemic pandemic, many specifically related to the Virginia Connolly residents. Some of these expenses included vacancy loss, the higher cost of food, as well as food distribution costs when the dining room was closed, additional security, building disinfectant, disinfection, and personal protective equipment for staff and residents. We continue to experience higher costs, especially on maintenance materials for unit turnovers and food. These expenses, expenses have definitely been detrimental to our modest budget and any funding we could receive through ARPA funding that we would receive would be beneficial to the housing authority and the residents in which we serve. 
Your consideration is greatly appreciated. Best, Sandra, Sandy Fleet. The next letter is from Jan Lintner, Secretary of um, the Old Drake Hill Flower Bridge. During the difficult pandemic years, the Old Drake Hill Flower Bridge has been a respite and haven from the isolation that has been necessary. This place was a calming sanctuary where people gathered, maintaining social distancing to connect with family and friends or experience the calming impact of the outer world. This small parcel of land with its old iron truss bridge situated at the confluence of the Hot Brook and Farmington River is a special place. The bridge is in need of major work to repair its deteriorating protective coating. I suggest that ARPA money or any money freed up from other scheduled projects be used for the maintenance project to remove corrosion, repair, and repaint this 130-year-old icon of Simsbury, the old Drake Hill Flower Bridge. The next letter is from Janice Johnston. The old Drake Hill Flower Bridge attracts visitors to Simsbury from across the Northeast. As a volunteer on the bridge, I get to meet many of them. It is also a source of comfort to Simsbury residents. The bridge is desperately in need of refurbishment. Paint has flaked off during the years and areas of rust are visible. Repairs are needed before the venue will be a thing of the past. Maintenance is mandatory. Considering all that the town has put into the bridge, it would be a shame to lose it to disrepair. Janice Johnston. Next is a letter from Bryn Brown. Hello, I'm Bryn Brown and I live in Simsbury. I'd like to point out that the flower bridge of which I'm a volunteer needs maintenance and I'd like to see some of the fun go there. The bridge is a great outdoor place which provides respite to so many during this pandemic. We need to keep the bridge maintenance up because it's a great place to be outside during this time when places are closed and when we all need to get outside. Thanks so much for your time. This is Stuart and Gail Yaffe. As a Simsbury resident, I would like to advocate for using some of the ARPA funds to construct pickleball courts in Terrafil. While pickleball is enjoyed by all ages, it is especially popular among older adults. Simsbury has a significant older population. The importance of physical activity for older adults is well known. While Simsbury has facilities for so many recreational sports, the population popularity of pickleball has been downplayed. This is an opportunity while the funds are available to construct these courts. Next is a letter from Richard Giorgio, resident. I'd like to propose the following improvements to our incredible outdoor recreation areas. These areas provide safe distancing and healthy activities for our community. Outdoor venues have been increasingly in demand during the pandemic. Let's make ours better, please. The Town Forest Park has provided enhanced parking, a baseball field, and basketball courts, which have increased visits to the park. Number one, providing portable bathrooms nearer to the picnic pavilion and pond would promote usage and offer a cleaner and safer environment. Number two, removal of weeds and debris from the bottom of the pond, which deter swimming after midsummer. The pond provides a much needed swimming area for a longer period of time than our town pools. As we all know, the heat of the summer doesn't stop when school begins. The Dewey property on Terry's Plain Road. This property could provide a picnic area as well as a boat launch. The existing boat launch on Riverside Road has very limited parking and requires backing vehicles with boats in tow towards oncoming traffic. Both boating and picnic areas are much needed and again, provide folks in our community with safer outdoor activities. Thank you for your attention. This is from Pat Purcell. It seems that ARPA funds are available to the town to address needs which have arisen due to COVID-19. Although using a portion of these funds for recreational pursuits may not seem to fit those criteria, it has been proven that those who are more active and physically fit stand a better chance against this disease and others. One of the best ways I have found for those who, who fit in the senior category to stay active is through pickleball. There are quite a number of us, as well as lots of younger folks and families who play the sport. The number is growing fast. Although a few tennis courts are, are aligned for pickleball, there are no dedicated pickleball courts available in Simsbury. The building of courts in Terrafil would serve an ever-growing number of people looking for a place to play. Getting exercise and being outdoors is more crucial now than it has ever been. Thank you for showing interest in this chronic problem. Next is from Rich Murphy. APRA funds are to promote the recovery of those most affected by the pandemic. Certainly, there is no doubt that those most affected by the COVID are seniors who suffered the illness and who, restric who restricted their activities in so many ways. 
With APRA funds, we have an opportunity, not only temporarily, but even in a long-term way, improve the health and lifestyles of the population of the town's seniors and others. Use of the funds to build pickleball courts in Terraville is a great use of the funds. Terraville is an underserved part of Simsbury and populated by many seniors. Let's use the funds to permanently improve Simsbury. Just as an aside, the last time I was at the two newly lined courts for pickleball at the farms, I had to wait because the high school students were having a great deal of fun playing the games after school. This is from Nancy Murphy. As a Simsbury taxpayer, I advocate to provide funding for pickleball courts in Simsbury. Yes, pickleball is a great active aer aerobic activity for everyone and especially for seniors. For seniors to maintain fitness, aerobic activities like pickleball are a must. For seniors, reading, knitting, art, et cetera, contribute to mental health, but physical fitness is a must and outside activities as has been highlighted in COVID time is a must. There are few such activities other than walking that provide activity for seniors. Visiting in Florida, I have witnessed untold numbers of seniors over 65, 75, and 80 playing the game well and safely. I've witnessed untold adults and children playing the game also. In order for seniors to maintain physical and mental health and to say, sustain them as active, positive contributors to the future of our town, pickleball courts are a no-brainer. Seniors were physically affected by far the most by COVID. Using a AP ARPA funds for these courts seem as an appropriate use of the funds. Next is from David Hartwell. I'd like to strongly encourage you to proceed with using some of the funding received through the American Rescue Plan Act for construction of six post-tension concrete pickleball courts in Terrafell Park. I'm a 70-year-old male who enjoys playing this rapidly growing sport. We have a group of approximately 12 to 15 seniors who play several times a week, and many of us play daily. In addition to this, there is a group of approximately 25 people who play on the weekends. This sport is gaining in popularity as evidenced by the increasing number of people who are learning to play at the YMCA in Granby. We appreciate the town's effort to accommodate us at Simsbury Farms and Henry James Junior High, but would really like to have these dedicated courts for our use. Just to, oh, this is from Flory Man Manasia. Just a note to let you know that I approve of funds going towards designated outdoor pickleball courts as pickleball is a great physical and mental activity for seniors. We also would still need an indoor place to play during the winter as socialization and physical activity is still needed during the winter months. Next is Charlotte Cushon. Phil and I would approve using ARPA funds for construction of pickleball courts at Terraville Park to keep us seniors active and moving. Okay, um, Borden Schofield, Schofield. Good afternoon. As a longtime resident of Simsbury, 20 plus years, I've always voted to support our budgets. And even though I don't have town water or sewer, or do I have kids in school, I've always supported the town for the betterment of all. Now that I'm a senior citizen, it would be nice to have the town support us a little. I am part of a very active group of seniors who play pickleball regularly, even though we have no dedicated courts. Many times having to play with other Simsbury citizens in neighboring towns. Please help our senior citizens enjoy good health and companionship. This is from Mary and John Verbecki. I'm writing in support of using the American Rescue Plan funds for Simsbury pickleball courts at Terraville Park. Simsbury has a very active senior community and pickleball is only increasing in popularity. Also, updating our very special Terraville Park would be such a gift to the community. It is truly a diamond in the rough. Number two, if we could get a bike path to the Terraville Park from the rail trail, oh, that would be paradise. Thank you for your consideration. This one is from the Police Commission. The Simsbury Police Commission respectfully requests that the town of Simsbury use American Rescue Plan Act resources to fund its, uh, its full year, uh, fiscal year 23 budget priorities. These budget priorities are stated in the Police Commission's 23 Budget Priorities Memorandum, which was submitted to the Board of Selectmen on November 23rd, 2021, and again as part of the January 24th, 2022 meeting packet. It includes operating items such as six additional sworn officers and CNR requests such as replacement sidearms. Thank you for your consideration. Next is uh, Nick Mason. All. Thank you for holding a public forum on the use of the funds available from the American Rescue Plan Act. 
As a former member of the town's Board of Finance, I fully understand the competing need for funds to provide for recreation, maintenance of the town's physical assets, and economic development. The old Drake Hill Flower Bridge is unique in its iconic role for the town of Simsbury. Like the Hugh Blind Tower, Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center, and the Simsbury Chamber of Commerce's Art Trail Statuary Exhibit, the old Drake Hill Flower Bridge brings thousands of visitors to Simsbury every year, adding economic vitality to our town. Please keep the bridges upkeep and maintenance on your agenda for these funds from ARPA. Thank you. Christine Boswell. I would like to advocate for a portion of the ARPA fund Simsbury is receiving to be used to build the proposed pickleball court at Cherryville Park. COVID has taken a toll on people of all ages and limited all sorts of recreational activities, gyms, bowling, et cetera, while increasing the need for additional outdoor opportunities. We have been able to safely play outdoor pickleball throughout the pandemic and need additional dedicated courts that are available throughout the day to support the demand in town. Currently, pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the U.S. and surrounding communities who have pickleball facilities. Bloomfield, West Hartford are drawing people from all over the state, as well as Simsbury residents. This is a potential revenue for Simsbury businesses. More importantly, the pickleball facility would generate activity in Terrafield, which would help to revitalize that neighborhood. There is also an opportunity to provide many other learn-to-play pickleball programs for both youth and adults as pickleball tends to neutralize varying degrees of age, athleticism, and socioeconomic differences. It's cheap to play. The new pickleball courts would provide many benefits to Simsbury residents. Please give it due consideration. Thank you, Christine Boswell. This is from Maxine Asness. Asness. Dear Simsbury Board of Selectmen, I strongly urge you to consider directing a portion of the American Rescue Plan funds allocated to Simsbury for the repair and repainting of the old Dury Kill Flower Bridge. As you know, the bridge, which has become iconic for the town of Simsbury, has been a focal point for outdoor recreation and stress relief during the COVID pandemic. Walkers, runners, cyclists, and boaters have all been drawn to the bridge and its beautiful new park by the promise of the renewal that gorgeous displays of flowers alive in boxes and baskets can bring. The bridge is a major attraction and a national historic landmark, bringing residents and visitors out and about to our town. Currently, the bridge itself is in need of structural repairs. It has begun rusting badly in the many areas where the paint has peeled off. These issues need the town's attention urgently to protect this invaluable asset to the reputation of our town and to the businesses and other town events that benefit from the visitors that the bridge draws. Thank you for your attention to this request. Okay, the next letter is from Diana Yisley to the first select woman and board of selectmen for the town of Simsbury. I am writing as chair of the Aging and Disability Commission, as well as a dedicated resident of Simsbury, to request your consideration to allocate funds from the ARPA grant to purchase movable, accessible pathways to be used at Simsbury Meadows and other community areas in Simsbury to provide access on lawns and other hard-to-navigate surfaces for persons with disabilities, especially those using wheelchairs and walkers. There are several pathway options that can be used for events and gatherings and placed in areas as needed. These are not permanent pathways, but ones that can be placed in as needed on an as needed basis. There are pathways used for wheelchair access on beaches as an example. Allowing event and property access to all community members in Simsbury is essential to providing a sustainable, inclusive community. Seniors and those with disabilities have often missed out on many wonderful things that Simsbury has to offer simply due to lack of access. I hope you will consider allocating funds towards such an important investment in our community. Thank you for your consideration. The next letter is from Diane Nash. Who will speak for the aged, the elderly, and more gently and euphemistically called the seniors? Inclusive housing opportunities focus on ethnicity and income with a slight nod towards the handicap. Seniors, the elderly seniors, who age in place by choice or necessity since independent slash assisted living transitioning to full care facilities are unaffordable. These seniors are forgotten or ignored. They've paid high taxes to give to to give their children a good education long after their children were gone. They didn't pick up and move away. They supported open spaces and preserved land that is their legacy to the town. Even that precious legacy is too often threatened. Their eyes and hearing now faulty, they don't drive at night, and acoustics and meeting rooms are an issue. 
computers and Zoom meetings a Herculean effort. They remain unseen, unheard. What do they need? A few thoughts. Affordable deliveries, expanded busing services, zoning for accessory apartments. Inclusive housing should not focus on race and income, but should focus on keeping those who built and supported this town to be able to continue living here. Freeze their taxes. Give them a rebate, at least for the COVID years, that keep them indoors and paying for extra services necessitated by at-home quarantine. Evelyn Holland writes, please consider making painting of the Flower Bridge part of your upcoming budget. I'm sure you are all well aware of how important the bridge has been to our town and our state. Now that there is Hopbrook Landing Park, this gem is busier than ever. During the pandemic, it has been a much needed place to gather outside. Tourism has been at an all time these past two years. One of my jobs as a longstanding member of the ODHFB committee is to replenish the information flyers for the bridge and a flyer about local restaurants. I have to say that I have never gone through so many. In conclusion, the bridge's paint has been flaking off for quite some time and areas of rust are quite obvious. Preparing the bridge to have these repairs will take a great deal of coordination with several committees. Please consider putting this in your upcoming budget. Christy Water Warders writes, I would like to suggest that some of the town's ARPA funds go towards the repair and upkeep of the old Drake Hill Flower Bridge. I visit the bridge frequently, and it's such a wonderful and unique part of our town. It would be great to see this special place preserved for town events, weddings, and out-of-town visitors in future generations. It's such an important part of our history. Please consider helping to preserve it. And this last letter is from Deej and Deej McKay and Shireen Wassell. Dear town manager and board of select people, we are writing to you regarding the American Rescue Plan Act. And looking into it, we found the ARPA funding provides unique opportunities for local government to make strategic investments in long-lived assets. Please consider the old Drake Hill Flower Bridge regarding this act. The bridge is an icon in town that attracts many visitors and has been a refuge for many in our town during COVID. The bridge is in dire need of iron repairs and repainting. The last work was done on it in 1995. We hope this long-lived asset, the old Drake Hill Flower Bridge, meets the ARPA criteria. We appreciate your consideration in this matter. Co-chairs of the ODHFB. So that is the end of um, the public hearing. Um, I, I, before we, be, before we um, move to close it, I just want to add a couple thoughts. Um, first of all, as everyone can hear, there's a lot of ideas out there. We also started with a lot of ideas. And with the change to the to the final rule from the interim rule, there are some expanded definitions of how we can use the money now. Uh, we're just starting to look at that going forward. And we do have some prior, you know, there's priorities for all of us. And obviously, COVID relief is one of the main priorities that's out there. But we are going to look at um, capital items that have been or are in the capital budget for use. And um, we also need to look at things that have a big impact to our residents, um, you know, or that are important to our residents and that are also not ongoing costs. So to just weigh in here, we're going to choose to close this hearing, but you can still send us your thoughts through the email um, to the town manager, to any of us, and we will look to potentially have a future public hearing um, you know, after we know more or if we do put together a list of ideas to put forward. I would like to give Sean an opportunity to speak here if he would like um, as the co-chair of the work group. You're on mute, Sean. I double muted. Sorry, I have a speaker <laughs> and the mute, the, the, the famous double mute. Sorry. Um, so thank you, Wendy. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to jump in. I, I echo a lot of your comments. I appreciate folks coming out um, and sharing their thoughts with us. You know, uh, there's, there's a lot of ways to, to go um, and, and look at these ARPA funds. And, you know, I think as a board, uh, directionally, we've, we've talked at least at the beginning stages about making sure that we're helping uh, those at most need in our community most directly impacted. Uh, by the pandemic as that was the original intent of you know of these funds uh, but certainly some additional ideas to think of here um and and certainly uh some 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 follow-up items for us so appreciate folks coming out tonight yeah and the one other thing i forgot to mention is um you know the timeline there is no real timeline other than that we have to 
assign the money by 2024 and we have to spend it by 2026. So, so that's just to keep that in mind. And that also the, the board has to, will be voting on the uses um, of the money. So um, it's, it's going to come back to the board to make the decisions on the final use here, um, you know, along with help and recommendations from the town staff. So on that, I guess I'm going to ask if somebody would like to move to close the public hearing. Wendy, I'll, um, I'll move that, but I just wanted to add that, as sure. you said, the work group continues to meet, and I'd encourage the folks on this call, um, you know, that's where the substantive conversation is going to happen um, and ongoing, and I encourage people to, um, to watch those meetings and continue to provide their feedback. Thanks, Eric. I'll second. I moved. Who, I move who, to conclude the meeting. <laughs> you're not allowed to. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I do agree with his motion, though. So I did second Eric's motion. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So, uh, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And anybody opposed? Okay. So that carries. And now we are move on the public audience se session of the meeting. Um, so we have. For, I'm going to call, we have five people here for public audience. Please keep your comments to under five minutes. And the first person that we have up tonight is Bob Pacicelli. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, I can't see my tile, so I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. We can see you. I'm uh, merely here to report to the board that... Uh, we had uh, an important meeting with state staff, and by we, I mean uh, Wendy leading the delegation from Simsbury, uh, Eric Wellman joined us, and our two state uh, elected officials, Representative Hamps Hampson and uh, Hampton and uh, Senator Kevin Whitkos, had an important meeting with uh, state officials on uh, January 20 with regard to the state police firing range. We had uh, gone there for purposes of asking them to uh, potentially reconsider the rebuilding of the firing range in Simsbury, but we were met with a rather uh, direct uh, uh, declination, a rejection of any uh, willingness to reconsider. Um, it was a little bit surprising because I think many of us at least thought we had raised a number of important issues for the state to consider about whether it was really uh, the right project for the state police themselves, let alone being in the right place, but it was a pretty flat denial of reconsideration. That said, they did release to us a final report by a consultant who had been uh, hired to do uh, the plan for the reconstruction. And we learned a few interesting things. The, uh, the rebuilt state firing range would cost uh, approximately uh, $11 million. I believe that would be on top of the $2 million that was authorized for planning purposes. The construction would begin sometime early in 2023 and that because of the floodplain, the uh, floor of the main uh, building would have to be elevated 14 feet above the ground, which uh, I'm sure some people would consider is gonna make for a somewhat unsightly building. Uh, I wanna here uh, urge the Board of Selectmen to actively consider uh, taking a position on this matter and hopefully writing a letter to the state in opposition to the construction of this project. Oh my God. Even though it might seem we have a lot of time, uh, the legislative session is coming up, budgets will be authorized. And uh, I would think that uh, the views of the town ought to be made known uh, sometime within the next month or so, if they are to be impactful. So. Thank you for this opportunity. I hope you'll debate this uh, further. Thanks, Bob. We have Joan Coe next up. Uh, 
Okay. Now, can you hear me? Okay. Um, Joan Cole, 26 Whitcomb Drive. At the Personnel Subcommittee of January 13, 2022, one of the items was a union grievance hearing for Henry LaCherette, Public Works and Parks employee. Town Manager Maria Capriola stated that Henry LaCherette was on vacation and unable to attend the hearing. The hearing was continued. This appears to be another lack of process procedures by Town Manager Maria Capriola. Another item, update on Director of Planning and Community Development Recruitment, Town Manager Maria Capriola stated an interim could not be found for the position due to lack of time due to the holidays and the reduced pool of candidates. It appears that the municipal government community in the municipal uh, community, Town Manager Maria Capriola's toxic work environment has surfaced with professional candidates not interested in working under her management style. Why did Maria Capriola lie to the personnel subcommittee? It appeared that Town Manager Maria Capriola is once again creating a selection committee committees as a cover. Town Manager Maria Capriola will choose her selection as town planner regardless of the input of the committees. Recently, there was an article in the Hartford Current about a Black Lives Matter car sticker peeled from Jenna Smiley's car with a Trump sticker placed over the BML sticker. The Simsbury Police Department was called and they assured Lo uh, Joanna Smiley that they will continue to investigate the occurrence and find the perpetrator. Joanna Smiley told the police that she would file a complaint. In 2016, my car was parked in Town Hall parking lot with a bumper sticker affixed to my car. Bum, quote, bump, boycott Mitchell car dealership, end quote. When Diana Moody was shown on the parking lot camera removing my bumper sticker, SCTV video showed her sitting behind me at a meeting after she stole my bumper sticker. When I tried to have the Mitchell car dealership service my car, I was told that there was a note on my file, quote, do not service this person. This was a due to my political activism. My only recourse was to ask people to boycott the dealership. I asked the Simsbury police to investigate the theft and I would file a complaint for larceny six. Many officers tried to discourage me for filing the complaint since they would have to spend many hours writing the warrant and it would be denied as others have been denied by the state's attorney's office. I asked them to file the warrant and I would watch the process continue. Diana Moody was interviewed by the police and the report states, quote, after my years of frustration with Joan, she pulled the bumper sticker off her vehicle, end quote. By her own admission, Diana Moody feels she can destroy people's property if people frustrate her without any consequences. Diana Moody's social posting states, Steve Mitchell is her friend. After months of the Simsbury Police Department, I received an, uh, uh, received an arrest warrant, refusal form, prosecutorial discretion, refused. Investigator Holmes from the state's attorney office told me that there were more serious offenses that require their attention, although my bumper sticker was stolen, which is a crime. The 48 acres of Meadowood Triangle on Bondo Hills has been mowed for the past few years, which is a drastic change in policy. In the past, the turkeys have laid their eggs in the high grass and camouflage for their nests. Mowing the lawn has eliminated these occurrences. This land is a corridor between McLean Game Refuge and Great Pond State Park. Bird watching has been popular here as the pond increasingly attracts residents and migratory populations of birds and waterfowl. Spring and fall are particularly popular. The Meadowwood land should return to its national state by eliminating the mowing of the land. Then this land can once again be returned to a wildlife corridor. 30 seconds, Joan. Okay. There was a vernal pool on the property that should be protected. After the town acquired the Bondo Hills Fire Town, two bonds were demolished. The cost of the demolition was $19,000 each. Why did town manager Marie Cariola expect compromised bonds that needed demolition? This should have been part of the negotiations. As a, uh, the, uh, this indicates that people, oh, a oh, majority of my Twitter account, Twitter at Joan Cole has over 200 views with some over 500 views and counting. This indicates people are interested in being informed about town issues. Town employee salaries have not been increasing Thank in three you. years. 
The union no. contract, I just have one more sentence, remains in arbitration while town manager Maria Caprioli has received an increase of 165197 with the approval of the Board of Selectmen. All my comments will be posted, Sims Mary Pat, Twitter, Jones O, and Facebook, and pictures will be added to the posting. Thank, Thank you. you for giving me the additional time. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Um, okay, now I'm going to turn the floor over to Art House. Hi there. When hey, you're, hi, when you're in Selectman, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm on East Weetog Street. Um, the the purpose of of my asking to speak is the uh, State Police Firing Range. Uh, it was just talked about by Bob Patricelli, and I had not realized that the state had flat out denied to consider this issue, but I, I think uh, I have a couple points to make. Uh, you will be Pleased, I hope, to realize that I'm not making a money request uh, tonight. Uh, three points. One is it just doesn't fit a, sub a suburban neighborhood. I mean, you shouldn't have a firing range down there. When I'm, I'm two miles away, and I can hear automatic gunfire going off. Um, every so often, I have visitors who ask if we're under attack, and I point out, no, it's just the state police firing away down there. When they have SWAT drills, there's noise, there's traffic. I mean, it just it doesn't fit our neighborhood anymore. Secondly, is the state police and our own municipal police, they deserve a modern facility. I mean, police training is important. I strongly support it. I mean, uh, we they should have an indoor facility. They should have simulation of realistic events, uh, noise, distractions, you know, the intrusion of an innocent, uh, all sorts of realistic situations. Uh, a firing range is not just marksmanship, but it's also realistic situational uh, training. And then this is the environment. I mean, we're firing all that lead into an area where there's an aquarium well. I mean, I, I, I don't know when that catches up with us, but um, I guess, you know, you know, you have a problem when they're laughing at you. You're going to put a building up 14 feet on stilts. I mean, what are they going to do? Row in and, and, fire across the lake at, at targets or something. I mean, this is just way past its time. And uh, I hope as a time we recognize that there are all kinds of places in Connecticut where it could be and should be and for the good of our neighborhoods and for the state police, it ought to be. Thanks very much for hearing me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Art. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Carl Meyer. Uh, you know what? It, it, this is obnoxious. Do you think that I could go before Carl since what I... he? What he's going to say builds off what I'm going to say. Sure. Okay, great. Um, so obviously everybody can hear me. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your time. I uh, just want to preface this by saying first that our EMTs and paramedics in town are awesome and do a phenomenal job. Um, so some quick background. Uh, a family member had a medical event 1030 on a Wednesday evening, and we ended up waiting about or over 30 minutes for the ambulance to arrive. I didn't quite understand why it took so long, so I started looking into it. And I learned that the chief of Simsbury Ambulance had been stating for months at the safety subcommittee meeting that volume was going up and that they needed to ramp up their second ambulance. But on the evening of our medical emergency, they only had one staffed and it was out on a call. So we had to wait over 30 minutes because they had to call in an ambulance from Yukon. And that's how long it took for them to get to us. So I wrote a letter to the safety subcommittee, told them what happened and outlined my concern. And at the time I made what I believe was a pretty reasonable ask, which is that the Simsbury Ambulance staffed two ambulances 24 seven. Um, at that time, Eric, Sean and Maria jumped in and engaged in the conversation and I'm super thankful for that. However, it's been eight months <clears throat> and there's still no solution, no changes, and it doesn't seem that there's really much of an appetite to improve the level of ambulance services for Simsbury residents. So here's three questions that everybody should be asking the Board of Selectmen as well as the people who are listening in right now. Number one, why can't we get response time data? Six months of asking and the critical data that will tell our residents how long they can expect to wait for an ambulance is still unavailable. I'm willing to bet that if that data showed that response time was excellent, that we would have it already, but we don't. Number two, one of our selectmen asked Simsbury Ambulance if they could start attending their monthly meetings. This would really help align our town leadership with the ambulance leadership, and it would really enhance that partnership. Request denied. Now, why wouldn't Simsbury Ambulance want a selectman to attend their monthly meetings? It's not very transparent. And finally, number three, in a town that's growing, we have the equipment and the need, 
Why wouldn't the ambulance want to schedule two ambulances 24 seven? Totally get that staffing is an issue across the country, but even before staffing was a national concern, they had already refused to increase to two ambulances. So what would be the reason to oppose this? Is it money? Keep in mind, Simsbury Ambulance is not a volunteer organization anymore, and many of their staff are paid. Their receivables come from hospital transports and from the residents of Simsbury who give them money as part of the annual donation drive. So we've got many residents willing to donate, but Simsbury Ambulance isn't willing to increase their ambulance coverage. Now we know that even if we get two ambulances 24 seven, it's not going to guarantee 100% perfection. Nobody's asking for that. I'm really just asking that steps be taken to reduce the risk of having to wait an extended amount of time for medical help. And it really shouldn't be this hard. Simsbury Ambulance, yes, I agree, they're not a town department, but they're a public safety partner and they provide a critical service to Simsbury residents. By that definition alone, the Board of Selectmen and Simsbury Image really should be taking whatever steps are necessary to increase that staffing to two ambulances 24 seven. Thank you all, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Christine. And, and I'll turn it over to Carl. Okay, thank you. Um, after five months of asking, like Christine mentioned, um, we've been unable to obtain data on the number and percentage of calls that wait more than the advisable arrival time of eight minutes. We have spoken to people with a total of 100 years combined experience at Simsbury Ambulance, and they tell us that up through 2014, they were able to meet eight to 12 minutes, the overwhelming majority of calls. Since then, the number of volunteers has dropped enormously, and this was before COVID, so it's not due to COVID. It's due to something else. So we're still asking for two ambulances to be staffed 24 seven. We have a supporting petition signed by 500 residents. We don't think that it's a lot to ask in a town of 25,000 people. Right now we have one ambulance on 24 seven and usually two during the daytime, but that's not a guarantee nor even a commitment from Simsbury Ambulance. A few points of comparison, Granby and East Granby have a combined service and population two thirds of ours under 17,000. And they have what we have, one on 24-7 and a second during the day. Suffield has just 16,000 people, and they also have the same. Suffield also has 90 volunteers and a Hartford Hospital neurosurgeon on their board. I don't know the qualifications of the folks on Simsbury Ambulance's board, nor how they're chosen. Little East Windsor has a population just over 11,000, and they have two ambulances on all day and a third during the daytime. Is Christine's 32-minute wait time for her daughter an outlier, as some would love to believe? I fear not. We have heard from many residents, and this is just a sample of their comments. We needed an ambulance recently for a visiting family member who became suddenly ill. Had it been the cardiac event we'd feared, the response time would not have been fast enough. Next, we experienced a 22 minutes terrifying wait for an ambulance years ago. The response times are skewed and it needs to be fixed. Next. The Simsbury Ambulance owns three ambulances, but very little staffing for them. Next, I had a fall at a paddle court in Simsbury and could not move. 30 minutes later in 15 degree temperatures, the Granby Ambulance thankfully took me to Yukon for treatment. Simsbury Ambulance was unavailable at noon on a Sunday. Next, on occasion, dispatchers have struggled to find mutual aid ambulances to respond into town. From the minutes from the last public safety meeting from the Simsbury Ambulance president herself, 394 times we called for mutual aid. The question I'd ask is how many times is acceptable? 394 is 17% of the time. Next, there was a very well thought out petition and mostly accurate. It shows where the major flaw is and is a big reason I left EMS and moved on. Next, my son had a seizure last July. Thank goodness the Granby ambulances came, but it took longer than it should have. And I wondered why it wasn't a symphony ambulance. Now I know why. Next. Been going on a while and have had people on my street with life-threatening emergencies wait for an ambulance from Yukon. Next, we waited 20 minutes back in 2016. Had to wait for Granby back then. Memorial Day weekend. It was for my six-year-old. It was the longest, scariest 20 minutes. Next, they can't get volunteers and most medics don't want to work there. Next, hey, just wanted to let you know that the 32-minute wait time for an ambulance is pretty common in Sanitary. Overnight shift especially has many similar experiences. Next. A woman had a possible stroke and had to wait for 40 minutes the other night. It's a constant problem. I'm sure the actual responders, not administrators, will give you stories if it's confidential. 
the schools have often waited up to 30 minutes. The consensus of, and finally, the consensus of the folks with over 100 years EMS experience in town say that Simsbury has outgrown it in its current state. We need to bid this service like so many other Connecticut towns already have. Why wouldn't we? Why would we hold on to the past instead of finding out what's out there? It's literally daily life and death. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And that ends the public audience portion of the program tonight. And we were supposed to have a presentation from the police commission, but they have decided to move it um, to another time. So I'm going to do my first selectman's report. <laughs> now it's hard to talk after all that talking. So I'll try to keep it quick. But um, this may be um, not characteristic, but I want to say hi to my mom, Rini Germain, who is recovering at McLean. And she is in rehab and she has access to community, Simsbury community television, and she never has. So I just wanted to do that. Um, so one thing that we're all seeing is we're all finding ourselves back on Zoom after we thought we were done with virtual me meetings until Omicron crept back into our lives. I'm hopeful that this will be our last Zoom call and that in February we can resume meetings in person. Um, it is much more conducive for a team meeting to be in the same room and be able to look down the table and see each other. I do give Eric kudos for doing this for two years because I find it really hard to do from behind a screen. Um, after a little over a month on the job, I want to also thank my fellow board members for looking at the items before us in a nonpartisan lens and to always be willing to work collaboratively. Um, I, I, we, a lot of us talk we're, as we're allowed to talk and everybody's collaborative and we all seem to be working um, for the best interests of the town. One of my big priorities is communications and making sure that everybody knows what's going on behind the curtain. I tend to be an oversharer. Some people don't like that. But if you're out there in television land or online feel, or you feel like you aren't getting enough information, please let us know. And we want to hear with you and let us know what you're, you don't think you're hearing. I do want to thank the emergency management team. They did their second test kit event this past week, which got a resounding um, response that it was handled very well, just like the first one. So kudos to that whole team. And thanks, Maria, for managing that. I also want to thank everybody on the ARPA ideas. Um, we're meeting next week with Amy, our finance director, and she will give us the impact on the final rule. We'll be looking at ideas presented tonight, COVID relief needs that have not been met, the original list of ideas um, generated by the board or capital needs and other board of ed and board of selectmen um, items and other allowable items in the com community. So we're figuring out the best path forward um, on how to move forward on all this. Last meeting, I reiterated that our board will have our second goal setting meeting this Thursday. I think it's at four o'clock. I did want to say the uh, police commission was rescheduled. I know that members of our board did a lot of homework to prepare for tonight. Um, so what we plan to do is put our questions together so that we can give them to the police commission so they can come back with the responses and the data that we would have asked for tonight. And I also know the SBAA was tentatively scheduled to be here tonight, but they've also been pushed out a, a month. Um, and then I just want to comment on the state police gun range. There's a lot of talk going on around that, and we're going to um, talk about it later in the communications section of the meeting. And that's it from me tonight. I'll turn it over to Maria. Hey, thanks, Wendy. Good evening, everyone. I'm starting off with our um, coronavirus update. Our caseload did come down ever so slightly um, in the data that was most recently re uh, released. Um, we are still in the red alert. Um, we are still also seeing some of the highest uh, case numbers that we've seen during the entirety of the pandemic. Um, something that I think is important to note that the health district has shared with us is that individuals who might be um, testing positive through at-home test kits that data is not actually reflected um, in the data that the Department of Public Health reports out for municipalities. So the town by town numbers and statistics that we see, um, those statistics do only include um, testing that occurred essentially at a, at a you know, testing site. Um, but again, it does not include uh, testing that's being done at home. 
Uh, also um, of note, the health district did provide us um, with hospitalization data, um, both statewide and by county. Um, and they said that just under 60% of those individuals um, who have been hospitalized recently um, were not fully vaccinated. Um, they are still strongly encouraging folks uh, to seek a vaccination as well as boosters if you're eligible. Um, thank you very much, Wendy, um, for noting the second distribution. We had um, our second general distribution um, event to the general public for at-home test kits on January 19th. Um, I think that it went, again, very safely, uh, very efficiently. Um, we had approximately 560 vehicles um, come through. Um, and again, the event just went very smoothly. Um, we were also able to provide um, another round of uh, kits to um, stakeholders of ours that are serving vulnerable populations. Um, as well as daycares and some of our public safety providers. Um, we are also still promoting um, our list of testing sites in the areas for uh, in the area for people who are seeking to be tested. And there is a link provided in the report. Um, and also just a reminder that um, households can now sign up uh, through the federal government to receive four at-home uh, kits delivered to their home. And we've provided a link for that as well. Um, just in terms of our workforce, um, we are continuing to experience um, the most significant impact on our workforce um, for positive cases. Um, you might recall that I've mentioned that um, in December, for the month of January, we are trending to uh, essentially match that or potentially exceed that. Um, we are continuing to provide our essential services. Our critical infrastructure does remain open. But for our uh, non-essential services, um, if we are experiencing a slight delay, um, we're just asking for patience um, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, at this point in time, um, the health district based on our current um, uh, caseload, uh, as well as the CDC recommendations, um, is for folks, regardless of vaccination status, to wear masks properly and consistently in indoor public settings. Um, so we are just providing that reminder. Um, we are still requiring our visitors to municipal buildings to, to please wear um, a mask regardless of vaccination status. Um, as I've mentioned in the past, you know, our workforce, we are essential workers. Um, we have critical infrastructure. We do need to, to keep going. Um, and we're just asking for members of the public to help, um, help us keep that infrastructure going by masking up when you come to visit our buildings. And uh, moving on to um, Board of Selectmen business, um, as Wendy mentioned, the goal setting session follow up session will be uh, this Thursday. Um, we are going to have that in the main meeting room of town hall. Um, in the event that somebody um, is unable to attend in person or just not feeling comfortable due to COVID, um, we will be providing a link to Board of Selectmen members if you would like to participate uh, remotely. Uh, please just send us an email. We'll make sure to set that up for you. Um, a couple of additions to the agenda this evening. Um, these would require a two-thirds vote of the body to add them to the agenda. Um, but we do have two new appointments um, that we would like to add to appointments and resignations. Um, and again, we could do that with a two-thirds vote of the agenda. Uh, one was for an appointment to the Culture Park and Rec Commission, and the second was an appointment to the Zoning Commission. We also have a proposed item under um, communications. It would be a draft or a sample letter um, for the board to potentially um, send to the state regarding the police firing range. Um, and again, this could be added to the communication section of the agenda with a two thirds vote of the body this evening. And for department news and notes, um, an announcement, we're so sad to see our animal control officer, Mark Rudowitz retire, but very happy for him. Um, this is his second career. He also had a very long career um, with the City of Hartford Police Department, having retired from there as a lieutenant. Um, he has just been uh, an incredible resource for the community, well-loved, very knowledgeable. We're certainly going to miss him in his retirement, um, but really want to ask everyone to please wish uh, Mark well. He will be retiring at the end of this month. And a quick announcement from Public Works and Engineering. Um, Eversource has reached out to us about their upcoming vegetation management plan in Simsbury for 2022. Um, as we continue to receive more information, um, such as the mapping of where this will occur, um, we will make sure to include this information on our website, as we have done in the past. Um, typically, that work will begin in the springtime, usually around April. But again, just wanted to make folks aware that that is going to begin happening again in, in the near future. And that concludes my report this evening. Thank you, Maria. Welcome. So would this, would this be the time that we, I ask for a motion to add 
the appointment, the additional appointment to the boards and committees um, to our agenda. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Send I will move that, Wendy. Thank you, Eric. Would somebody like to second? Amber, like to second? Um, all those in favor of adding that? Aye. Aye. And then we also need to get a motion to add the communication section to the letter to the communication section. So if somebody would like to make that. Heather, moving that. Any second? Second. Sean? Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so the amend the agenda is amended to include those. Um, next up, we have our selectman liaison and subcommittee reports. If anybody on here would like to weigh in, we're like to hear from you. Okay. Oh, I, oh. I'll, um, oh, I'm sorry. Did you not call me, Wendy? No, no. I was waiting to see if anybody wanted to say anything. So there you go. Yeah, I um, have an update from uh, Spirit Council. Um, they are starting off in February with a uh, four-part historical awareness of race series. And I wanted to highlight the event on February 3rd, um, which is um, going to be a discussion of the 1839 Armistead Uprising, the uh, Supreme Court decision that followed it, and then the critical role that Connecticut residents played in supporting uh, captives struggling to regain their freedom. Um, that's just part one. Um, it's a virtual program that will be coming to you live from the Simsbury Library, and you can register on the uh, library's website under virtual programs. Thanks, Eric. Anybody else? Uh, just a quick update that uh, the presentation we had had planned um, on the ambulance is now going to be on the 14th, right, Maria, at five o'clock. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a there'll be a meeting uh, before the meeting. Uh, that evening. So I believe all six of us are able to attend that. So folks that were tuning in or want to hear more about the, the much uh, discussed ambulance topic, uh, we'll, be, we'll be running a presentation then on the, the 14th. Okay, thank you. So it's it's almost 730. And we, we thought we had, we only have three items for selectman action. We thought this would be a shorter meeting. But um, our first item for selectman action is our tax refund requests. We move effective January 24th, 2022 to approve the presented tax refunds in the amount of $23,386.64 and to authorize town manager Maria E. Capriola to execute the tax refunds. So moved. Eric, thank you. Second. For a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Ooh. I'm on mute. Yes, I see that. <laughs> the crown license renewal for Barn Door Hills. I'm going to let Maria um, speak to that if she'd like to. Great. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so as many of you know, we do have a number of agricultural parcels um, that we own as the town. Um, and this particular um, piece of property has been leased um, by the current farmer since around 2016. Um, we haven't had any issues um, with this current farmer in regards to um, their stewardship of the property, um, and they are interested in continuing to farm the parcel. Um, typically, um, for these sorts of parcels, um, we will usually do a three-year term, um, and this is also a good time of the year um, to proceed with a renewal so they can be ready to go for the growing season. Um, so our recommendation would be to um, renew the lease with this particular farmer um, for this parcel in question. Anybody want to talk about this? Okay. So move effective January 24th, 2022 to authorize the town manager to execute an amendment to the current ground license with Hall Farm for a three-year extension of the ground license for the town-owned agricultural property at Barn Door Hills Roll Road East, parcel A and C, 17 acres, and the storage of produce in an existing town-owned Barn located on parcel IDE 04207001I, aka Barn Door Hills Triangle. That move. Second. So, who, like, I guess, Chris, I'll give it to Chris and I'll give Sean the second. How's that? Um, any di discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat>
these are really the appointments and resignations. So um, the one that we just added should go after these. Masking. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that would typically be what we would do. Okay. So we have a lot of um, reappointments here, and I was going to do them by committee, if, if that works, and just read the names and the dates for each person under a committee, unless there's a better way to do that for anybody. Just a parliament point, Melissa, can we just can we just move to appoint everybody in their entirety as listed in the document? Yeah, as presented. Yeah, I think you can do that. Okay. I okay. make a motion to reappoint or appoint everybody as presented in the attached document to the Board of Selectmen agenda. Okay. Um, I'll second that. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? <laughs> Hi. Hi. So that was that was much easier, Sean. Thank you. I try to do my friends a favor once in a while. <laughs> Woo. Okay. So the next item up is appointment of Jackie Battos as an alternate member of the zoning commission. Move effective January 24th, 2022, to appoint Jackie Battos as an alternate member of the zoning commission with a term ending December 4th, 2023, to fill a vacancy created by the, by the resignation of Diane S. Madigan. I'll move that. Sean, any second? Jackie, second? All those in favor? That's Heather. That's Heather. Oh, oh, who did I say, Jackie? <laughs> you have a flashback. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. <laughs> okay. So welcome to the, as an alternate member, Jackie. All right. So the next one is a resignation of Rob Burt Helfand from the Board of Ethics. Move to accept the resignation of Robert Helfand as a regular member of the Board of Ethics, Ethics retroactive to January 18th, 2022. I'll move. Amber's move that. And I'll, I'll second that with our uh, with our thanks. Let's okay, see. Eric, second that. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Working off a of paper here. The additional appointments to boards and commission committees. Um, the move effective January 24th, 2022 to appoint Christine Boswell as a regular member of the Culture, Parks, and Recreation Commission with a term ending January 1st, 2026. And move effective January 24th, 2022 to appoint Tucker Sauls as an alternate member of the Zoning Commission with a term ending December 4th, 2023. So moved. Eric, move Thank that. I'll second. Sean, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, I keep turning myself off mute. It's habit from being at home. Okay, so then we're moving on to the minutes. Did anybody have any changes um, to the minutes? Corrections? Remember? I did. Um, and I'm scrolling through all these appointments. Um, on the board and commission update, it says that um, I was discussing the zoning committee closed their public hearing um, on public act 21-29 and it says parking standards which the the public act is regarding the state statute regarding governing accessory dwelling units hmm. not parking standards and then it says the vote to opt out of this act and we'll send a memo to the board along with analysis on st on state dwelling units which is what I said, uh, I believe, during that meeting was that the zoning board had voted to opt out of the state statute and that the zoning board would be sending the board of selectmen an analysis that shows what the state statute um, dictates regarding governing accessory dwelling units and what the town of Simsbury regulations are. So I, I just don't think that Mm -hmm. This captured really, you know, what my report was saying. It's not accurate. Yeah, I noted the the parking statement in there. I didn't right, the and it's not state dwelling units. It's it, you know. 
So can we ask to, for the minutes to be corrected and then move to accept them with the corrections? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's so what you do. Do you want to move it? <laughs> You got to say what the corrections are. That you I don't know. Before. There was a lot of corrections. Well, there. I, I just went through that. Okay. That's okay. what I said. Somebody, did someone take those down? So it's to, to make the corrections, to correct the parking statement in there and to include the, the, the references that Amber said was, were stated at the meeting on the 20 and the 10th. So could somebody want to move to make those corrections? Do you just, I does just well, Sean made it. I don't know if it still stands because I hadn't said them yet. Okay. No, it's Amber's motion to make. It's the, the her okay. corrections. Okay, so Amber. So, okay, I will make that motion. Okay. That's anybody want to corrections? Thank you, Sean. And all those in favor of aye. Aye. Okay. So now we're in the communication section. And I wanted to just kind of tee up um, both of them. Well, one of them requires some conversation. There was a memo, Trish, um, between Trish and Maria about potentially discontinuing the service that we offer to residents for um, hunting, fishing, sports licenses out of the town clerk's office. And um, I don't know if you guys want to provides the reasoning rationale behind it. Sure, <clears throat> excuse me. I can start with just some introductory comments and then um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Trish. I think this might be Trish's first board of selectmen meeting um, in, in her new capacity. So also just welcome to Trish. Um, so as you know, Trish is our, our new town clerk. She's, you know, taking an opportunity to really evaluate um, services we're providing, how we're providing services, efficiencies we might be able to achieve. Um, this particular service um, that we offer, which is issuing um, fishing licenses and hunting licenses, um, it is a service um, that currently, I would say there's relatively low in-person utilization. Uh, about two dozen or fewer people a year um, have been taking advantage of the in-person service. Um, it is a service um, that's a discretionary service, uh, meaning that it is a service we don't, we are not required um, to provide by law or, or policy or anything of that nature. Um, there are also currently other uh, means for people to be able to obtain their licenses. Um, they can do so online um, or they can actually um, do so at Dick's Sporting Goods. I and mean, then we do have one within a relatively um, you know, short, short drive of Simsbury. Um, so those were some of the, the reasons behind, again, the low um, sort of utilization of the in-person service. Um, but there is a high level of staff time needed to process each of those requests. Um, and then we um, are only issued $1 by the state um, for every license um, that we do actually issue. Um, so Trish, I'm not sure if you might like to provide any additional information. I had to figure out how to unmute myself. Um, yeah, Maria, that's a really good overview of uh, the situation with the sporting licenses. It really was just um, given that our, our staff was pretty stretched, we were looking for ways that we could streamline different things. Um, we don't do a lot of sports license issuing. There are a few times a year where we might do a few more than other times. Fishing is one of those time seasons, maybe April. Um, and really depending on, we, we do receive just a dollar for even for multiple transactions by an individual customer. So if they got three or four different types of licenses, we still get the $1 for the transaction. So um, besides the lack of um, uh, transactional, the low transactional cost in the um, to the town, there is just the time involved in our the resources that we have. So it does take about 15 minutes or so to process. Um, and that's if everything goes smoothly. There are some times where we have to look up certain types. There's a lot of different things that are issued. We have to look up and see if we can even find it in our current register on or with the deep. And so uh, that takes us quite a bit of time. Um, and I just, we do have many available on-site locations where these licenses can't be purchased. As Maria said, Dix is one of them, but neighboring towns, um, there's a whole list provided of, of on-site locations. And um, our neighbors in Avon, Granby, and Canton all still offer this service. So um, 
And then also it's very easy to do online through the DEEP website. And I had proposed if we do a discontinue the service to make sure that, that our um, residents know that there are other places and other ways to secure these licenses. And absolutely, if they call, we can, we can provide that information as well. So anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them if I can. Trish and Maria. I'm just going to give my feeling is, um, you know, regardless of the amount of money that we take in and time spent, it's it's taking away a service, however lightly used by our residents um, or, or forcing people who may not be adept at going online or driving up to Dick's. And also the list provided did include a lot of our neighboring towns. Um, so, uh, you know, if they can do it, I kind of feel like we could do it. And maybe we just message um, put out the uh, way to do it online if we already if we have or don't have it. So it might diminish the number of people that come to us. But I'd like to hear what other people have to think about this. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think we've probably already burned the time savings and talking about it between the emails and this meeting. So um, I, I, I'm in favor of keeping it. I, I think it sends the wrong message. And I'll be honest with you, it can be interpreted the wrong way um, by certain folks that are in this um, community that would that would use a hunting license or use a fishing license. Um, you know, it, it, it takes, you know, a fair amount of time to do many things at town hall. And, you know, we're not in the business of making money. We're in the business of providing services. So I, I get it, but I, I, this, I mean, the time savings doesn't really even move the needle um, from an impact to overall services. And I think it, it puts us in a potential to create unnecessary perception targeting a certain group of, folks that that might enjoy these types of sports what what i what i would yeah I, i'm with, i'm with sean on this um you know there's the I, i'm certain that there's probably a, a fair number of I, I mean we know this low volumes but there's probably a few people in there that are um that could be the seat could be seniors that aren't so tech savvy or travel savvy or whichever it is or comfortable going to wherever um maybe First of all, I applaud any 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 anytime someone bubbles up an efficiency idea. That's that should not be looked at as something that we wouldn't uh, certainly appreciate and respect. We love that um, uh, <clears throat> that being forward thinking. So thank you. Um, but maybe as we maybe it's a, it's a phased out process where we over the next two or three years, uh, each time those recipient or the, those those purchasers. Applicants, part of me, come in. Uh, we remind them that there's alternative ways to provide this to obtain their license, and that remind them. And then, two year, a year from now, two years from now, three years, whatever it is, that this service is going away. So that we're conditioning those folks because I doubt that we have a lot of turnover in the hunting community. It's not something that someone comes in and just does for a year and then, and then goes away from it. So probably a dialogue can be started with those folks and the fisher people as well. So maybe that's that's the way to approach it. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? I'm just I'm also in agreement with you know across the board what the three of you have said. I'm, I'm not really comfortable right now with um, getting rid of of this service. But to Chris's point with the efficiencies and and you know it is great to be as efficient as as possible. But, um, you know, perhaps if we went along Chris's line of, of fading it out or something along those lines, but, um, you know, I do think that it is a service that we should continue to provide. Okay. I do agree that promoting, you know, and even just perhaps promoting the, the deep, the direct deep website, you know, and, and, uh, will, kind of drive people to that as opposed to, to coming in kind of organically. I really don't like the idea of suggesting people go to other towns to, to get that done because I, I don't think we would appreciate it either if Avon or Canton or somebody stopped doing it and then told everybody to come to Simsbury and have us process their, their uh, permits for them. So I would be in favor of trying to, drive people uh, it suggests to them that it's available online and you might it might just be a you know a matter of people not knowing they can do that and then like chris said phasing it out hey thanks 
Is it, is it ultimately up to you guys or do you take our input and decide which way you want to go? Yeah, you know, it, it typically would be an administrative decision, but I think that the feedback um, that, you know, we received was very helpful. Um, and, you know, perhaps we can, you know, loop back Trish and, and Melissa and I and, and maybe, you know, do something as Chris suggested in terms of, you know, having an informational piece that we could hand out when we issue licenses and kind of explaining to folks that there are these other resources um, you know, available. And, um, you know, we'll continue to look for, you know, efficiencies. Um, you know, again, it's very challenging. I think as we've shared in the past, um, you know, we have our sort of our core services that we're required to provide um, by statute or perhaps by charter, um, sometimes by federal law. And sort of, um, you might recall in some of your budget documents when we provide those core services, right, there's what we call the discretionary column of services, which is truly very, very small. Um, so when we're looking at things to potentially, you know, where we can maybe change up and and perhaps shed as, again, more and more, you know, federal and state requirements keep getting piled on us. It's that very sort of narrow column of discretionary items that, again, are things that we can kind of potentially have these sorts of conversations around. Um, and so, again, if, if there are things of, of that nature in the future, um, you know, we'll continue to look for, for those opportunities. But, um, but no, I, th- I mean, I think that's, that's very helpful feedback and we can continue to provide the service. And again, I think just trying to educate folks about the other um, ways that they can get that processed. One just quick question is, are all these, um, licenses an annual license or do any of them have an opportunity for like a multi-year ex- renewal? They're annual licenses. They have okay. to do them each year. Mm-hmm. Like the dog licenses. Yeah. yeah yep. very similar. Okay. Is the renewal process any mm, faster than when they come in? For, you know, you said that it's, it's a long process time. Is it like, a, can they do an auto renew or anything? That's- no, you really have to start with, um, if they have a license from the previous year, you can use that as your ID number. Um, you can use their license to get in. And then there's um, a number of screens you have to go through because there, there are so many options. Um, and, and if the person is getting what they got the year before, it's, it's a little easier. We can kind of just look at what they have on their license if they provide it, and we can kind of go from there and get them the new license for the new year. Um, It just gets a little bit confusing sometimes when people aren't sure what they're asking for. There's a number of, um, I I wish I'd provide you the the page of where we have the whole menu of what's available. It's very complicated besides the fishing, the resident, the non-resident, and all of the different aspects of the hunting with, um, you know, just muzzle loaders and arrows and different things like that. So there's a, there's a lot to it. And um, sometimes people aren't super clear on what they are trying to get. They don't know what it's called. So it takes us a bit of time because again, we don't do them that often. So we sometimes have to contact deep. We have to look at their menu and, and really kind of figure this out. So um, with a very busy office that we have that sometimes can take, it has taken up to a half an hour to kind of get that secured. So it's, it's one of those things where um, I understand the interest by the public, but we also have, um, as Maria said, a number of obligatory things in our office that we are um, mm-hmm. stretched pretty well on that we have to get accomplished. So sometimes we're looking for ways that we can still serve the public, but um, in a different way. And this was my proposal to do that. Thanks. And Trish, thanks for thinking outside of the box. We all appreciate it. This is government. No, so. <laughs> yeah, and I want to clarify, Trish, this is not exactly the best welcome to the Board of Selectmen. So um, and in, in no way were my comments insinuating that, that you were targeting in any way a, a specific group. I'm just laying my perspective on it that sometimes the things that we do um, have unintended consequences. And by no means do I expect you, but that's, again, what the six of us are supposed to opine about whether right, wrong or otherwise. And that's essentially what we do. So I I do appreciate you looking at this. And, you know, as we do look at budget, it's budgets and everything else. I mean, I've often, you know, said if we could just ignore the state and stop doing all the unfunded mandates, you know, how many millions of dollars would we save? So, um, you know, not lost on me, what what is crammed down on you and uh, the entirety of of town staff? Well, we appreciate you, Pat, and we appreciate your support. Okay, great. Um, we're, oh, so next up, like, I'm going to turn this over to Eric. Um, the, the, this whole gun range discussion started with Eric transitioned to me. Um, we got involved with the state where I, my position is to just look at it from a Simsbury perspective and impact to residents, businesses, environment here. Um, so I'm going to let Eric talk about the letter and get feedback on it. Yeah. Let me just, um, 
start by saying that it's purely coincidental that both of these items were in their communication uh, section at the same time. Um, you know, in, the, in this item, um, you know, we we learned, um, I learned through um, an article in the uh, Hartford Current a number of months ago that uh, the state had been looking at other options for building a, uh, a, a training facility for the state police and looked at about four locations and ultimately um, settled on um, renovating the location in Simsbury. As we know, the one in Simsbury is not ideal. It's near, um, it's near um, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of homes. Um, it uh, floods on an annual basis. It's on stilts. Um, you know, what I am advocating for in this letter, and I hope that it's something that the board would be comfortable endorsing, is that one, um, the, the state police need and deserve a facility uh, that meets their training needs. Um, and also the residents of Simsbury, whether they're in their backyard uh, barbecuing or they're dropping their children off at Latimer Lane, should not need to listen to automatic gunfire. And that's something that happens today. So I actually think that no, no community, uh, urban, suburban, et cetera, um, should have a, that quality of life issue. Um, so this is asking the state um, to um, look at some of the other options, um, including an indoor facility uh, that would both meet the needs of the police um, and meet the needs of nearby residents. Thanks. Does, any, does anybody want to add to this or have reservations about doing this or what they would want to say in this letter? Um, that would I mean, be I'm, helpful. I'm, yeah. I mean, I, I'm fine conceptually. It doesn't make any sense. We're so far from the highway. It's got to cost ungodly amounts of money for the police officers to transit here from all over the state to train. I agree. I mean, and again, I'm the chair of public safety and I certainly believe in, in training police officers, um, but I've never quite understood why it's up here um, or why there aren't multiple facilities, right? It does. So all of that makes a lot of sense, but I, I, I do have to be honest, and this is the other side of it is state police range closes tomorrow. You still have automatic weapons fire down there. You still have it because there's a private range is not going anywhere. So this doesn't actually solve the problem if the range goes away. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be clear here. Um, you know, and I've had similar experiences. We had a, a couple of friends from Australia who think Americans are all gun crazy. And, um, you know, we're like, no, no, no. I mean, you know, everybody's reasonable, you know, tons of folks have guns in town, but it's, it's no big deal. And it was this beautiful Saturday morning and all of a sudden, you know, it sounded like World War III down the road and we're used to it. So we didn't even hear it. And they're like, oh, my God, you know, are you under attack? But uh, so, you know, we've all got those those funny stories. But at the same time, again, it, that that's going to continue, even if this range were not to be uh, funded further. So I, I don't want to give residents false hope that we're going to in any way be able to influence, you know, what we hear on Saturday mornings or Friday nights or otherwise. And again, I think everybody in this community agrees our police officers need to be trained. And at the end of the day, if this is the only place that they could be trained, I disagree with the location, but I'm fine with them being trained. So, yeah, Sean, I agree and acknowledge all of those points. Um, I, while the uh, Medicon gun club would still be there, it would, you know, presumably be less noise because it would be half as many ranges that are there, um, but. Um, yeah, so I, I yeah. yeah, I'm agreeing there as well. I think it's, there's enough of a rationale just to reduce the, reduce the, the noise pollution by 50%. I think it's probably greater than that because it's the intensity that occurs there during an exercise and training. Um, I think that's, it, that is, can be shocking to some folks. Um, yeah, I, I, I've spoken to a, couple of officers and who've, who've had, you know, have to go there for, for validation of certification and they think the place is a joke. Um, and it's kind of a joke amongst many of the uh, state police members. And there's lots of politics involved as far as who's controlling it, who, who, why it's there and whatnot, and the amount of effort that wants to get, um, you know, go into pushing back, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm less, as much as it's about removing it from, from Simsbury um, because of the noise, as much as it's about that, I think as a state taxpayer, I think it's laughable. That's what pisses me off the most. I think the place is, is it's a joke that we're putting, we're asking these 
these individuals who do so much for us to train in a facility like that. I mean, I can I can't even imagine if you were to visit other state police training facilities across the country um, and see what uh, see what they have as options. It's, I think it's it's pretty probably likely pretty embarrassing. So as a taxpayer taxpayer to Connecticut is really what pisses me off. I'm sort of tired of it about. But what I would ask though is. Um, you know, to not to throw, throw, you know, just sort of the great grenade on the table and walk away. But what do we have for recourse, for legal recourse? Um, because it seems like it's something that's just sort of steamrolling past us. You know, how far are we willing to go? I mean, we put a letter out there, but do we have the ability to, as the municipality, to stop it, to force a deeper review and consideration and get this put in front of legislature and such? Or are we just sort of putting window dressing up here. So does anybody, has anybody researched that? Yeah, Chris, I can comment a bit on that. So from a jurisdiction perspective, um, we're fairly challenged in this regard on this project because it's state-owned property. So what a lot of folks don't realize about state-owned property is there is an entire um, team of state building officials who administer the state Mm -hmm. building code. So for this project, in terms of that permitting aspect, the inspections, it'll actually, um, it will be state uh, building official staff that are permitting and inspecting the project. Um, Where our local building official would be involved is only if they need to do demolition work on the property. Um, He would have jurisdiction and review in that matter. Um, In terms of the fire code, similarly, because it's state-owned property, um, the state has their own state fire marshal staff that will do the permitting and the inspection work. Um, At the local level, um, our local fire marshal would only be involved if they need to do some sort of blasting work or a blasting permit is needed at the site. Um, And then on uh, the environmental piece, um, rather than our local wetlands folks and our local wetlands regulations, it's actually um, stays deep. Um, that will, again, do the environmental review and the permitting for that piece. Um, also, because it's in a floodplain, um, it's likely that the um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, so the federal government, would have um, some permitting um, and inspection work as well. Um, so that makes it a little tough for us because, unfortunately, we just don't have much jurisdiction at all over this particular project because of um, its location and who owns the property. Um Where I think we can certainly have a role is definitely in terms of advocacy for any sorts of community impacts that we're concerned about, whether it's environmental, whether it's noise, um, whether it could be traffic impacts. Um, What the state, um, at least some some staff members that we've had um, contact with over the last six or so months have shared with us is that um, the current plans are not to expand the facility, but are really to renovate the very dilapidated uh, buildings that currently exist there. So things like updating the bathroom, storage, um, the parking, et cetera. Um, but again, I certainly think it's absolutely you know, appropriate if this board feels strongly about serving again in an advocacy you know, capacity on those issues that would affect the community, um, that that's certainly something that you could absolutely have a role in. I just want to throw one thing in here. Um, they, they said it wasn't expanding capacity, which was my concern because if there's, but if you do read that state document that I sent um, they do talk about expanding the armory, not by a lot, but uh, by a bit. So there was a little bit of an expansion in there. And then the other thing that um, Senator Wickos brought up, which was when Griswold was presented with this, they rallied the troops in Griswold to, you know, get a, the town together, you know, to go to bat for it and stuff like that. And he, he, you know, pointed out, we agreed that that is something that we have as, as a tool for later on, if, if it goes further down the road. But I do agree that um, right now, I think, you know, if we just want to voice our opinion and go on record as saying, you know, we're not real thrilled about this being here. Um, and here's here's what we say. And then, you know, we just kind of see how it progresses and keep keep tabs on what's going on. I would agree with that. I think that we have to start where we can and work the angles and within the realm and maybe raise more community awareness as well, too. Um, did you all see the Valley Press, the big Valley Press article too this week? So, Could, uh, Wendy, when you said that they're, they're, they're stating it's not going to expand capacity, is that the actual original? Are they basing that off the original capacity or the usable capacity today? Because I would guarantee you that the space and the number of individuals that is far reduced. 
So I would, I would hold them to task and say, are you actually going to just maintain the current capacity that is actually usable now? Or why is it actually, are you sort of exaggerating? So if, if you read that, I just looked at one part of the document showing the current to the new, like where they're doing renovations. And I zeroed in on Armory, which is where the gun range and the firing happens. And it went from like 290 square feet or whatever to 400. And it's and then somewhere else it said adding two lanes or something like that. So that was that was what I looked at. I mean, they're doing classrooms, they're building up other parts of the facility. Um, but my concern was getting back to the noise factor is are there going to be more state troopers using the facility um, than there are today? Because originally they said they're just hardening the infrastructure. I guess my other question too is with a new facility, do they come with does it come with new with um, events more often there. I mean, oftentimes when they when they have um, events there, you know, just driving down that road is very difficult um, with, you know, the parking situation, but also does the noise increase due to, um, you know, hosting more events and uh, for the state police there. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And <clears throat> Wendy, I believe in the past, uh, this, it's just piling on for research, but I believe in the past, the federal agencies, if a federal agency wants to use a facility in the state, they would be using the state police facility and that all level of federal agencies for, for, for those individuals that are, that are residing and working out in the state. They don't go to a local private local gun range or a private, they use the state police. And I believe that they found, I believe that the correct, that <clears throat> the federal agencies found Simsbury's facility to be inadequate. And, um, but that they did, the last time around, they did offer to participate in the cost of a facility in that the Connecticut State Police declined to allow the federal to allow federal dollars to participate in a new facility because that would have given them up some control. So now I'm curious to know, or in making check with Senator Whitcoast, are the federal agencies now utilizing that range that is down on the coast or are they someplace else? Or is there potentially a way to reinvigorate that con that conversation where that they might be invited back into the tent to be a participant in a facility that's, that meets their needs as well, i.e. someplace else, because Simsbury is inadequate. Uh, well, I, I don't know the answers to that, but I, I want to- It is for the paper. It is for the paper to research. Well, here's here's the thing. Whitco's was definitely pushing hard against the state at this meeting. He pushed them to use the outdoor range in Meriden because they said they wanted an outdoor range. Um, I kind of feel that it's- that, you know, and they're on board that they should be like doing some of this heavy lifting on this project, um, you know, unless it gets a lot closer to us uh, and looking into that, because he he hit them up with a lot of questions to follow up on. So. Yeah, he's had multiple meetings with multiple commissioners, right, as he indicated last time. I mean, this has been going on for four yeah. or five years, I think. Yeah, I don't even know, but he was really he really pushed back hard. Yeah. At this meeting. So I was very much appreciated. Um, and I'm hoping that they follow through on the asks that he had. They followed through on one ask so far. Um, so, but, but what we're dealing with right here tonight is do we want to put out a letter? And then we kind of, you know, we've done some due diligence here and we've we've let our feelings known. And then we just kind of keep tabs on what's going on. Well, Wendy, if I can, I'm hearing, you know, general consensus that um, okay. I think in, in in support of the crux of the letter, I think the question is, you know, I know this was just added to the packet this morning. Um, if people wanted to, hadn't read the letter, we could certainly wait until our next meeting to vote on it. But I just wanted to see if people would, would be comfortable um, endorsing the letter tonight or if you'd rather see it on the agenda on the 14th. Meanwhile, the legislative session starts next week? The 9th. 9th. So we've got some, I mean... Mr. Patricelli's point is right. We can't wait long, but I think if we if we do it at our first meeting, I, th I think we'd still have time to get it in before this was addressed, if it is addressed in the legislative session. So, yeah. 
Okay. okay. I'm okay with waiting until the next meeting. Uh, that gives people more time to review it. It'll be in the packet. Okay. Okay. Then I, I think we're almost at, we can look for a motion to adjourn. Like, is that, is that possible? I'll move that. Okay. Anyway. A second. And okay. second. Everybody raise your hand. Well, I saw Heather second first. So um, Sean and Heather, I'll give it to them. And all those in favor, say I am um, doubly in favor. Okay. Good see night. You guys.